Welcome to Think Tech on OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Donna Blanchard. And I'm Emily Lau. In our show next time, we'll cover the Grassroot Institute October Calabash on the question of whether our state government will go bust in 2015. It featured a panel discussion among Paul Harleman, Senate Minority Research Office, Senator Sam Sloan, Budget Director Talbert Young, and economist Paul Brubaker. As everyone knows, Hawaii has huge unfunded liabilities, lowered revenue projections, and soaring project costs. Do these spell financial disaster for our state government? And how will this affect you? Senate Minority Research Officer Paul Harleman says yes, the state will go bust. This was followed by a discussion among Senator Sam Sloan, State Budget Director Talbert Young, and economist Paul Brubaker. Paul Harleman led off, followed by remarks from the three other speakers, all moderated by Grassroot President Kali'i Akina. Uh, well, the, the question whether um, Hawaii will uh, deplete its general fund cash reserves by 2016 is really based on key um, assumptions uh, relating to future revenue growth, uh, to the current budget cuts that were recently made by the State Finance uh, Director, Mr. Young, and ultimately the budget that will be enacted during the upcoming session. So the, uh, the forecast that we at the Senate minority made uh, shows that if the upcoming uh, legislature doesn't cut spending or increase taxes, and if the current Council on Revenues um, forecast is accurate, the 2013 surplus of uh, $844 million could be uh, completely uh, depleted as early as 2016. We'll start first with Senator Sam Sloan. Uh, will Hawaii go bust in 2016? And I answer that simply by saying no. No, we won't go bust in 2016 as long as we have at least one living, breathing taxpayer that we can squeeze even more money out of. <laughs> we'll be fine. We'll be fine. Now, I want to also say, uh, as I've said for four years and probably damaged his career immeasurably, uh, Calbert Young is um, one of the finest finance directors we've had in the state of Hawaii. He's been very diligent in his work. He's been very upfront uh, in explaining uh, information. He's talked about our tremendous unfunded liability uh, and the fiscal challenges that have faced us. And Paul Brubaker? Among other things, I think we have the Bank of Hawaii covered here today. We're okay. Uh, but Paul, of course, uh, headed up also the, the Council of Revenue so he can share insight with you. All of us are concerned about the, the fiscal situation in the state of Hawaii. And it is serious. And it is something that um, you need to be concerned about. Because every time we try to, to explain things, I know people's eyes kind of roll over. Uh, and they don't want to hear about some of the negative things that, that occur. And yet they're extremely important. And you have to keep in mind, any time an economist tells you that um, this is the trajectory or this is past trends or this is what's likely to happen, well, there are other things that are likely to happen as well. Some of them can be positive and some of them can be negative. I've seen a couple of budget directors, but Calvert's been really impressive, you guys. And the reason I mention it is, right after he came in to the administration, um, the other think tank, uh, I can't remember what they're called, HIPAA, he, the HIPAA guys. Well, you hear it was a real think tank, but the, the political, <laughs> the, the HIPAA guys had a conference, and it was all about how the budget was broken and we were going to be running out of money. And so I went to that conference. And I said, um, well, it looked like the recovery was actually happening, so maybe they were uh, overly concerned about it. This time, um, it's sort of halfway through the uh, Abercrombie's four years, the wheels came off, and, and contemporaneously, people weren't really picking up on it. So I just wanted to illustrate um, how you began to see that in the tax revenue performance. And, so, you know, the general fund is basically a barometer for the whole economy. So if you see something happening there, the question then becomes, where is it happening underneath? So here's the general fund uh, adjusted for inflation um, and adjusted for seasonality. It's still a really noisy series, and you have, um, you know, things happen, and 
people make things happen like refund lags. So are you guys going to do a refund lag to the next go? <laughs> <laughs> For the first time ever, there will be no refund lag, those big spikes to the bottom. Uh, I'm actually uh, very bullish on the future prospects for Hawaii, uh, both uh, uh, for our economy and for our overall state government. It is true, I agree with Mr. Harlman that a number of serious hard decisions have to be made financially for our overall state budget. Um, but that has been true, uh, that was true when I came into office uh, four years ago. In fact, the state was in a far more dire uh, situation four years ago and actually that was a better condition than it was uh, three years prior to that. The state during the last recession had some severe financial fiscal challenges as your state government. Uh, and it was not easy bringing the state back um, even after I came into office uh, under the Abercrombie administration. In fact, if you look over the last four years from where the state of Hawaii uh, was as a government entity to where it is now, we are in a much stronger position. In fact, moving the state from 2011 to 2013 with all those slides that you saw should have shown you was that the state of Hawaii came out of the recession faster than the vast majority of other states in the country. And as a state government, our financial condition improved very significantly from 2011 to 2013. It is true that overall financial status has growth has, has kind of plateaued over the last year. Um, but it has plateaued, I think, at a milestone position for the state in the history where you have, if you think back, back to 2013, the big number was the state had an ending balance in excess of $844 million. That was the largest positive ending balance in the history of the state of Hawaii. It wasn't large historically by percent on a percentage basis relative to the general fund, but it was the largest dollar amount. Uh, and I think a lot of politicians don't believe that it takes a lot of work to get there. It's, it, you don't just get a positive ending balance on that order of magnitude uh, as a finance director by just allowing it to happen or having the economy contribute a lot of revenues. It takes proactive management of expenditures at your state government level. It takes discussions with legislators to be of the understanding that you, can't ha you cannot have expenditures growing at the same rate as revenues because that is unsustainable. How do you respond? As I mentioned earlier, we're already experiencing uh, deficits, so it's going to come down to the next um, administration that basically has, um, has a very important uh, um, choice to make, whether to increase taxes or whether to cut spending. And, um, you know, I, I think what's going to come up probably is uh, perhaps we're going to see um, a couple bills that will come up next year where uh, they're going to try to increase the uh, GET perhaps, you know, because if you have to fund a deficit of about four, about four to five hundred million dollars every year, I think the only tax increase that could do that is probably increasing the GET. This discussion was followed by some interesting questions from the floor. Back in 2012, the state did refinance, mm -hmm. not restructure, because the state previously, I, I make a distinction between restructuring versus refinance. They did refinance about $860 million worth of previously existing debt into lower interest rate debt uh, at the time because of the interest rate markets uh, and did garner about $40 million over the long term of um, savings, of future debt service savings. We have uh, joined within the last year directly with uh, legislators in Guam and Puerto Rico uh, and Alaska. It, it makes perfect sense. Uh, we have shown the figures uh, about what the additional costs to this economy are and uh, it would be uh, a benefit from uh, our standpoint. In addition to that, I think it would help stimulate the economy and produce uh, additional initiatives. So it, uh, it's a win-win-win situation unless you're in the maritime industry and making political contributions. Well, the answer again is, is yes, I'm concerned. Uh, and I think we, we all are concerned. Um, the, the printing of more dollars, the $17 trillion of debt does not create wealth, does not create improvement, creates a tremendous burden, uh, not only on the economy, but on future generations. Uh, but again, it's, it's something that, that the public uh, really doesn't get interested or excited about because they don't see how it directly affects them. 
They want a higher minimum wage so they have more money. The unions are uh, constantly uh, asking for, for more money. But we're not giving more value, and, and that is a problem. We, we actually have been using um, foreign investment money. Uh, UH West Oahu uh, was actually partially funded through what's called the EB-5 loan program, which, which takes uh, foreign investors, primarily Chinese monies, uh, and invests them into a loan program for public entities to use. It is a loan program, though, and, it, and the investment is small, about $14 million at UH West Oahu. But we also invest about $80 million through this EB-5 program for, air, for Hawaii's airport system as well. So there is an example of Hawaii utilizing those funds. Um, there's, I'm sure there are more other avenues as well. The speakers then had an opportunity to present closing statements on the subject of the discussion. Happily, it seemed clear that our state government won't go bust next year. How serious is this threat? What do we need to be looking forward to in 2016? What can we do? We have to, we have to cut spending uh, immediately. And we identified that we have to cut spending by at least $500 million starting uh, next fiscal year. I think the question is, is the glass one-eighth full or seven-eighths empty? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I think $500 million is a good target. Um, it, it, it's going to be very, very challenging. That uh, it, was, it was not easy the last four years to find um, what anywhere near $500 million in the existing budget. Cutting expenses is easy to do to be said, but very difficult to execute on, uh, given the dynamics between the legislature and the executive branch. Um, I think the state's well positioned. I think what's good that you should take away, as I was talking to Carol earlier uh, at my table, is that uh, these are all very uncomfortable subjects about problems, but you don't get to solve them or, or resolve them until you actually admit where you currently are. And that, I, I feel very glad to have been the finance director over the four years. And if that's the only thing I that I leave as the state is that to bring attention to where we currently are. I think, I think the most important thing over the next four years uh, and 20 years for Hawaii is diligence of the public to recognize where Hawaii currently is and how far do we honestly have to go before you get a truly sound financial plan for the state. So I don't lay awake at night worrying about this. Um, my sense is a seven, if you have a $17 billion problem and a $75 billion economy that's growing 2% per year, it's manageable. The real question is, how do you get about doing it? And um, I don't think we've dug deep enough in this conversation, so I'll tell you a story. I've never had a conversation over at the legislature. I was just thinking about this. Nobody's ever, to my knowledge, had a conversation or a hearing or whatever where a bunch of economists had this conversation about uh, changing the nature of the contractual arrangement with the public workforce to make it more, um, uh, to, to include, incorporate more incentive-based compensation. And when I consulted with the Hawaii Health Systems Corp, this is what we talked about. The privatization allows you to change operationally the way this, it, so even if you don't spend any more money, you're getting more output because people, so, but ironically, the only person that's ever called me up to have this conversation is Randy Pereira of the HGEA. He hired me to go around to every island, talk to all of his island leaders about the imperative to go in this direction because of the impact of aging. Aging makes it impossible to get them to the mathematical solution we're looking at by just cutting spending. You have to change the structure of the system. Now you see why Calvert Young is totally irrelevant. Um, I, I don't care whether the glass is one-eighth uh, full or empty or any of that. I care who owns the glass, someone privately or whether the government has taken the glass. And I think that's the real danger that, that we all face. I would remind everybody that uh, any law that the legislature passes, a future legislature can uh, obviate that law and uh, get rid of it. So when we talk about uh, paying 30 years out to <laughs> these things, <laughs> God bless you if you believe that. Not going to happen. Uh, the other thing is, uh, it is true that we need the public to get behind this, and we need people in office and in positions of power to say, we've got to cut 
spending. We've got to put government in line with the people's ability to pay. Now, we had a guy like that. His name was Tom Apple. He proposed at the University of Hawaii to reduce spending and consolidate positions and reduce salaries. What happened to him? They fired his butt out of there. And that's what's happening here. It goes all the way back to George Mason, our hero, when he was the first head of the Department of Business and Economic Development. And he turned money back. And the legislature told him, you ever do that again, you'll never get a budget you want. And that's the whole thing that we have to change. Right now, the emphasis is on spending. The unions will take every last nickel. You have to stand up and say no, and you have to examine spending and make sure that it's worthwhile and that we can afford it. It was certainly an important question and a provocative discussion. The speakers were well chosen and qualified to comment, and the audience was well engaged. This is the kind of conversation we need to have in order to stay in touch with fiscal and policy issues that affect state government programs and operations, and ultimately, every one of us. It's particularly important that we have this kind of discussion now, in advance of Election Day, to stimulate public thinking and raise awareness about the fiscal positions taken by candidates for state office. Good for the Grassroot Institute for organizing the discussion of this calabash. We hope there are more by Grassroot and other organizations in the community, and we look forward to covering them. And now, let's take a look at our ThinkTech calendar of events going forward. ThinkTech broadcasts video and audio for all of our talk shows live on the internet from 1 to 5 p.m. every weekday afternoon. If you missed a show or want to replay or share any show, they're all archived on YouTube. Visit thinktechhawaii.com for our live stream and YouTube links, or to join our email list and get these links and program advisories on our upcoming shows. We also invite you to be part of our live audience at our downtown studio in Pioneer Plaza. Contact j at thinktechhawaii.com. Raise your awareness in every way on ThinkTech. <laughs> ThinkTech will present its 15th anniversary celebration from 5 to 7.30 p.m. on Thursday, December 11th at the downtown Laniakea YWCA. We're calling it ThinkTech United. This will provide an opportunity for our hosts, guests, moderators, and speakers to reunite. And all our viewers, listeners, supporters, and friends are also invited to unite. Come join us and be part of it on December 11th. You can learn more and register to attend on thinktechhawaii.com. And now here's this week's ThinkTech Commentary. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel with this ThinkTech Commentary. 
My neighborhood is a little wet, so we don't have as much PV as other neighborhoods. When I walk around, I count the number of panels on an average house, and it seems to run anywhere from 10 to 15, depending. They're standard size panels, but I keep thinking that one standard size panel, or possibly slightly smaller, could easily fit on top of a car. Two could probably fit on a van. Who knows what the technology will bring? Maybe they'll be smaller yet. How much trouble would it be, actually, to fit a panel or two on the top of your electric or hybrid car or van and run the power from the panels to the battery in the car? That sounds pretty easy and could provide a trickle charge to keep your battery topped off, even without a nearby charging station. If you could get enough panels up there, if you left your car or van out in the sun enough, you might be able to run it simply with the charge from the roof. Why not? We interviewed Alex Tiller, a Hawaii solar entrepreneur who is now the CEO of AutoWatts in the Energy Accelerator. It has developed dealer software to design rooftop photovoltaic installations for new electric cars. The idea is that the owner's rooftop powers his car. That's great. And in a world migrating hopefully to electric vehicles, it will be very helpful not only for the dealers but the customers. On the other hand, given the growing efficiency and the lowered cost of panels, why not put that installation right on the car itself? And how about another energy company, one that springs up right here in Hawaii, that can find a way to attach smaller panels on the roof of your electric vehicle to charge it continually whenever it's outside? If we can make or find photovoltaic panels that are small and efficient enough this could be disruptive technology and could give electric or hydrogen cars a new and powerful dimension in the marketplace. It could be a comforting feature in the ongoing war against range anxiety. Do you know about PV panels and the inverters and the latest technology? Could you find a way to install them on the roof of a passenger vehicle? Could you connect them to the battery of that vehicle in a way to trickle charge it all day? It doesn't sound that complicated. And it does sound like it's worth a shot. If you can see yourself doing this kind of thing, why don't you take a whack at it? If you succeed, you'll change the future of electric vehicles and transportation, and that's a big deal. If you succeed, you'll be in clover and famous, and buyers and manufacturers will beat a path to your door and seek you out. If not, well, what a great experience trying. I'm Jay Fidel with this Think Tech commentary. Aloha. I'm Donna Blanchard, and this is a Think Tech commentary. I'd like to talk about disasters. As a hurricane heads toward Hawaii and the Ebola virus reaches its deadly fingers across the globe, we're all faced with deciding when we will get really serious about this stuff. Our attitudes are already forming. You know what I'm talking about. One person rushes to fill up his gas tank and cupboard while his neighbor carries on life as usual thinking about how many hurricanes have resulted in a little more than scattered leaves and greener lawns. They're both shaking their heads at each other. Likewise, one person orders biohazard suits for a family while another barely notices the news about that disease, mostly halfway across the world. When do our defenses kick into gear? I know people who at all times have stores of food that could feed half the town for a month, guns and ammunition, books on reclaiming farmland and surviving near apocalyptic circumstances, and communication equipment so archaic it would be vital if our grid ever fails us. I personally have a Swiss Army knife and a small flashlight. And I try to keep at least half a tank of gas in my car, but I often fail at that. I did stock up on water and cupboard food for Hurricane Izell. I brought my furniture in from the lanai, battened down my hatches, and waited for her. Back in the Midwest, I also sat in basements waiting for tornadoes to pass and stocked up on groceries when we knew a blizzard was heading our way. And I have always asked my employees to stay home when they have a fever, cold, or flu symptoms, regardless of the season or impending threats. These things are common sense until it becomes uncommon. What I'd like to focus on most about life-threatening weather and viruses is our humanity and maintaining goodwill and patience. I recognize that we've all got our boiling points, and disasters have a way of heating things up quickly. After all, what we're talking about here is threats to one of our most primal needs, safety. 
I don't want to be the person without a roof over my head and I don't want to be the vulnerable sick person hoping to God that someone will take really good care of me until I'm well again. When our most basic needs are threatened, and they are, we shouldn't be surprised when we and our neighbors react in surprising ways. And we all need to remember who we are and how we define ourselves. I can remember riding in the car on snowy roads with my family and it seemed like we always stopped at least once per trip to push someone else out of the ditch. My parents wouldn't dream of driving past without helping. And I remember how good it felt, laughing and slipping and sliding on the snow as we pushed in unison until the grateful stuck people became unstuck. We were careful. We were stocked up on groceries and had plenty of fuel in the car and generator and we laughed together as we helped others. Those are some of my most cherished memories. I don't wish for disaster, but when it does come, I'm going to look for ways to get some more of those memories. I'm Donna Blanchard, and this has been a ThinkTech commentary. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of ThinkTech, but first we want to thank our underwriters. Okay, Emily, that wraps up this week's edition of ThinkTech. Remember, you can watch ThinkTech on OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Jay Fidel does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. Definitely, Donna. For lots more ThinkTech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on ThinkTech on OC16, visit ThinkTechHawaii.com. Be a guest or volunteer, a producer or intern, and help us reach Hawaii. Thanks so much for joining us on Think Tech and for supporting tech, energy, diversification, and globalism in Hawaii. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important weekly episode. I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm Emily Lau. Aloha, everyone. Oh, oh.